Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so Michael Pelius asked me to um, sit in for him today, uh, which is always difficult because he started. <laughs> 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 because he, you know, Michael is sort of. I always say Michael is our equivalent of uh, what was the French teacher who taught. He believed. Yeah, Jean Hippolyte, you know, uh, who never slept. You know, Michael Pelius doesn't sleep. He sleeps two to three hours a day. Uh, <laughs> who always had this kind of incredible fusion of ideas and systematized the entire Western philosophical <laughs> canon, which, which should be the sort of the bare minimum in a certain sense if you're going to teach something, right? If you're going to teach Western philosophy. So in a, in a certain sense, you know, Michael's an incredible um, presence. And um, so I'm just going to take a small piece out of what he probably was going to talk about Gramsci, and he's going to come back to Gramsci to, to fill in uh, what he didn't say today. So I'm not going to spend time on, <clears throat> yeah, you know, the... Does he give, did he give you the assignment for next week? No. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, what I would say, you know, we started with Gramsci and the essay in philosophy, and, um, you know, there are many interesting things in the Gramsci reader in this selection, but of course, for me, the central sections are, in addition to the, to the discussions of philosophy and Marxism, the central chapter is probably the notes on politics, which is the, often translated as the modern, you know, known as the modern prince, which in this edition uh, begins on page 123 and ends at 206. And this is like the central, yeah. Would you just introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Arto uh, Artinian. I am a member of the uh, Institute for the Radical Imagination and Situations Journal Collective, and I teach at the City University. I teach at uh, Borough Manhattan Community College. Yeah. So, um, so the, the, the modern prince is essentially, this, at least in this selection, the central political uh, point of focus for Gramsci, distilled from his notebooks. And it has his key interventions on questions like, which we're gonna, I would sort of dabble in today, the, the elements of politics, what is politics? the political party or the question on political organization in the contemporary setting, you know, the early to mid 20th century. Um, it has notions of the economic corporate state, such as the transformation caused by Ford and the invention of the, of the industrial scale uh, generalized commod commodity production, right? So the Ford Model T uh, essentially marked the, uh, the early high point of the conversion of the capitalist the functioning of capitalist society from sort of 19th century society analyzed by Marx, um, which in the political sphere was characterized by imperialist uh, wars over uh, the, the possession of, of territorial entities like occupying colonies and for resource extraction and provisioning of markets. Uh, but it didn't really have generalized commodity production. Not everything was commodified in the 19th century uh, for example, English political economy. I mean, some things were commodified, other things were not. But with the introduction of, of, uh, of Ford and Fordism, you know, in the political sense, so you have the mass production um, uh, of cars and every, any other commodity soon thereafter, you know, refrigerators, uh, food, um, and that accelerates into the 60s with the mass production of uh, explicitly of desire, of, of, of emotions, of, of affect, right? Something that 60s philosophers called the, the economy of the libido, you know, mm. how capitalist uh, 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 circulation of capital and its increase also uses the subconscious and the unconscious as explicit points of focus. So it moves from the material to the immaterial, which is, of course, we, we, where we are now. Um, and so Gramsci understood this in the 20s and 30s. He understood that the development of Fordist enterprises where you had workers living in the company towns in a new way. You know, they had access to better housing than in the 19th century. They had, they could buy the stuff that they produced, right? So the Ford car could be affordable by the Ford workers themselves. That was his, that's the principle of Fordism. I mean, that it's- That your worker can buy the product. Yeah, it's a major, it's a major innovation in, in terms of capitalist uh, uh, hegemony, as Gramsci would say. Uh, buying the consent of those that you uh, have power over and then who's, whose feature of their lives, their labor power, you, you depend on for your own uh, position of primacy in society. And then, of course, <clears throat> the Fordist model, model becomes extended after World War II with what, what is now called the military-industrial complex, which is basically the, uh, 
you know, the, the total fusion of capital with the state, where, whereas that was not exactly the same way true in the 19th century, right? In the 19th century, in, in many early capitalist societies, the state, which had remnants of the previous dom previously dominant social classes or social blocks, uh, struggled against capitalists as a class. Um, so I think that's the central part of, um, one of the central parts of Gra Gramsci's uh, selections in English, at least. For example, uh, he does have a section, you know, Americanism and Fordism, right, on page 277, which is a huge section, 60, 70 pages. Um, so I don't know what Michael's going to do. He's probably going to do sections from the modern prints after the essay in philosophy. So I thought it would be interesting to take a look at these two notes on the elements of politics and the political party, maybe in one hour. And then the second hour, and we can reverse the order, the second hour to look at his conceptions of what is known as, as the Gramscian military metaphors, you know, the war of position and the war of maneuver, which is a complicated idea because in this collection, you know, on the pages that we, we read for today, you know, the 232, 233, he says that his use of military terms should not be taken literally uh, and should not be transposed directly into political thinking and political action because they're more like thought devices. They're more like metaphors. Like chess. But in another section of his notebooks, he says exactly the opposite. He says it's actually impossible to separate politics and war in the modern world. So, it, so he, I think he totally believed it at one point, or he didn't at one point, and then he changed his mind at another point, or he was thinking about it. So uh, I propose we, we take a look at Gramsci's military uh, metaphors, you know, the war of position and the war of maneuver as they apply to politics, but also the question of war and is it different from political action or is it not? And, uh, and also maybe, let's also take a look at the, um, the section on elements of politics and the political party. So this would be sort of the focus for today, I thought. And then Michael next week can come back and uh, either continue from here or he'll go back to the philosophy essay and maybe integrate. So having said that, I'm not going to be able to go into great detail of the central concepts of Gramsci in politics, among others, which, as we know, are, mm, I'm just going to say it here sort of briefly. Gramsci uh, says something about the state that's very different from what liberals believe in, right, in his time and today. So in the liberal political conception, which is dominant in the world today, and it was dominant the world in his world, as well, you know, the British Empire, the French em Empire at the time, uh, American, uh, uh, the American state, and the people that, that uh, played a leading role in it believed in the liberal notion, which is there's a state which is often associated with the, the sort of government or the structures of the concentration of political power, the way, the way Weber talked about it, where the monopoly and the legalized use of um, coercive, physical, or violent, otherwise violent force is preserved in the state, i.e., in the parts of the state uh, broadly known as the government, you know, the, the, the police, the courts, the <coughs> legal structure. Um, so in the, liberal, uh, in the liberals' political sense, there's always this tension between civil society and the state, right? So you see that in America today as well. So there's always the government, which is like this all very powerful um, uh, human created structure which has a tendency to be authoritarian and and it, it has a tendency to exist to to justify its own existence right so if you are part of the of the bureaucracy of the state your immediate loyalty is to the bureaucracy of the state right so this is sort of like a central um, tenet of liberalism in the idea that civil society is sort of like a like a force that's outside of the state and in some ways, it's the most important part of political society, of, of the political community, the civil society. It is threatened by the state, or can be threatened by the state if we're not careful. So there's a tension between the state and civil society. So you have to have a Bill of Rights in order to, uh, in the U.S. Constitution, in order to prevent the state from becoming uh, too powerful and starting to act in its own logic against you, the citizen. So in the liberal sense, there's a separation between the state and civil society as, as uh, itself. Uh, for Gramsci, um, that's not true. You know, that's a misconception for liberals, for liberals, at least in the 20th century, you'd say. For, so for Gramsci, the state uh, equals two things. So he has a formula, sort of. Uh, the state is civil society plus political society together. 
form the state. And what does that mean? Um, uh, civil society and political society essentially are the way the state is politically organized. Uh, so the state is much broader. The state includes civil society. The state includes political society. Um, and the way the state functions is that it functions under the hegemony, which is the other word, of the dominant uh, sort of forces and alliances of forces within the state, i.e. within civil society and political society. So in order to have power, as understood by uh, leftists, right? in order to have power, you have to have a dominant presence in both civil and political society. You can't just be controlled institutions. So, so briefly, what is political society? What is civil society? So political society are basically the institutions of, of, um, of what the liberals would call the state. So political society would be you know, the different parts of the government. Political society might be the legal system. Political society is um, in includes the courts, the education system, um, and civil society pretty much includes everything else. The domain of culture formation, which shapes identities or cultures, um, and pretty much everything else that does not fit in uh, in in political society. So it's in in Gramsci's thinking, you know, as a Marxist, which which is to say, as somebody who um, think logically through Hegelian dialectics, this is sort of like um, sort of a, um, some kind of a Hegelian or Marxian dialectical pairing, right? So civil society and political society are not identical, but they're mutually complementary, even if they have contradictory functions. It's totally OK to have contradictory functions contributing to a whole functioning of, a, of an organism, right? So this is, this is the basic truth that liberal political philosophy is uncomfortable with, uh, and that Marxist or, or Hegelian philosophy is totally, or Aristotelian philosophy is totally comfortable with, right? So in other words, contradictions, opposites, um, things that are not aligned uh, are not an exceptional case, uh, but they're actually the norm. That's how we, that's how we are. Heidegger would say, you know, that's our ontological inheritance. We can't explain why, but that's the way it is. We f exist through these contradictory uh, forces, you know. Uh, and we'll say more a little bit about that because it's connected to the notion of freedom. Right? Maybe we should say it now as sort of a general introduction, but um, when we read Gramsci or Lenin or, uh, or Marx or any of these, uh, you know, some of the, uh, most of the people I know, some of them I know on this wall, but you know, like Che Guevara has said this as well, uh, what is freedom in the political domain? And in the political domain, freedom in the liberal mind uh, is closely associated with the possession of particular um, uh, often known as rights, right? You have certain inherent things because you're a human being that even an all-powerful entity like a state should not be able to transgress. Um, in the Hegelian sort of Marxist tradition, you know, Hegel said this, Aristotle said this first, then there was like a pause for a few thousand years, and then we came back <laughs> to it. And, and, and Spinoza and Hegel provided the next clarification of this, which was taken by Marx and then Gramsci and Lenin and Che Guevara and, and uh, uh, the Kurdish, I think she's a Kurdish. Yeah. yeah. I read two of her essays that, that commented on this. So freedom in the Marxist tradition, like Gramsci would say, is, is uh, achieved and thought through through the concept of negation. And Hegel basically said, where this is uh, explicitly discussed in the science of logic and other places, uh, what moves people in politics uh, is the ability and the willingness and the desire at times to say no. Like, I'm not going to do this anymore, or I will not, or we will no, no longer do this because of whatever. So why is that important? Because, and this of course connects to um, thinking about how we experience our lives as we live it, i.e. through the movement of time. And Hegel divided this, like he did everything in, in trios, so there are three things, the past, the present, and the future. and and, and in the Hegelian logical formation, which Marx explicitly uses in writing Capital, but it's, it's hidden in Capital, it's not as obvious, because he thought that everybody knew Hegel's science of logic, and you know, he didn't have to say, I'm using Hegel, um, is that we live in the present, but there are certain movements that condition how we make sense of the present. There's the movement of the past to the present. There's a movement of uh, you know, uh, the present to the past, 
Uh, there's, but there's also uh, this sort of movement of the future to the present. So many people have said this, starting f from Hegel and Marx, uh, but these are the kinds of things that are happening. So if we live in the present, how do we, we live in a world where things are formed? You know, there are certain borders. Uh, we in our own bodies have a border. We know where we end and where we begin, right? And this is the basis of human uh, subjectivity, right? So you know that you are a person uh, and you have certain limits and certain borders. Right, literally, and it's like, don't you're in my space, you know? Literally, that's a trivial comment, but, but, <laughs> you know, so so the, the the fundamental tension in humans in the Marxist tradition, which uses this Hegelian dialectic, is that we as human beings have certain well-formed borders, right? We are aware of them, but at the same time, we know that we're also finite, that we're going to die. So so the fact that we are sort of have a definitive end, but at the same time, we also have this sense of control over our own being, sets up this, this, this tension that moves people. And out of this, Hegel says, well, uh, hmm. what is the movement expressed through? The movement is, is expressed <coughs> through transcendence of borders. So for example, if, I, if my border means I'm a peasant, and I was born into a family of, of peasants in Russia who, uh, or China, uh, and that's my social class, and that's, those are the circumstances of my life, I could live my life within those borders. And I can simply continue the past to the present, move, have a tradition that I get from my parents, dupl replicate the tradition, and just live my life. And that's totally what millions of people can do. Other people could say, well, I am a peasant and I have these features. This is my being and these are my uh, sort of notions of life and, 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 and everything else. But it doesn't make sense to me for some reason. Well, for these reasons. And I'm no longer bound by these borders. You know, and of course, this is the po fundamental political moment. The fundamental political moment is the movement from point A to point B, individually or collectively, right? So for whatever reason, you are dissatisfied, you are, you know, the situation is untenable, or whatever the case might be. So the, the, philosophically, the, the problem is, how do you escape the well-formed boundaries of your social everyday surroundings? which include your thoughts, your, your body, <coughs> physically, your practices, your social networks and relationships. And the idea is you have to take that risk. You have to plunge into the future. You help make a future by essentially overstepping the boundaries of the form, whatever that has been formed, right? So um, that requires the necessity to say no, to negate something, right? Uh, however, unlike simple formal mathematical logic, uh, in Ar Aristotelian or Hegelian or Marxian logic, dialectical logic, A and not A uh, means something else or means something different than what the same sentence means in mathematical logic, right? Uh, and then you get this interesting idea of I negate the conditions of my current existence. I will join the Communist Party in 1927 Italy. I will thus risk my life or uh, my job or my career. You know, Elaine Brown was, by the way, downstairs, and I was listening to her, and it, it kind of struck me how clear she was on this. She said, when the, we did the Black Panther Party and we did politics, she said, we just did, we just did what, what we felt had to be done, sort of irrespective of the costs, you know? And it was said with such kind of charisma and conviction that you can tell that she totally believed this. It's, it's completely clear the, the power of negation and its relationship to freedom. Right? So the condition for freedom in politics in the Marxist tradition is the condition of exiting that which exists politically right now. That revolves and demands saying no or rejecting something or negating something. But this is not identity politics. This is not saying I'm going to make a different choice and not <coughs> this choice that's available to me. No, it means saying no means immediately dis discharging power or force, struggling against Right, that which exists, because if we use a uh, like like Engels did, uh, Gramsci makes references in the War of Maneuver. Uh, Engels used this metaphor of physics in study in the study of politics. That in the physical objects are constantly subject to force or different forces. Right. So Engels liked to make this um, uh, metaphor to to physics, and he says in the physical world, uh, in order for anything to move and exert its presence, if you will, it has to overcome forces that are pushing against it, sort of in the Newtonian model or I guess any other model. There's always this uh, presence of forces in different ways. So in politics, it's very much the same. So when I negate something that is that I'm a part of or that's part of me, uh, I immediately have to project 
force. Otherwise, I will never be able to exit that border. I will never be able to cross that border, right? So I think this is the background to what I think Gramsci was thinking as he tried to use the military metaphors. In other words, how do we think explicitly in terms of forces, almost like in physics, uh, and bodies, uh, and in terms of borders and limits? People have used words like limits. And, um, and if you think about it, this is a very powerful <coughs> idea in, in, in revolutionary thinking on the left, but also on the right. Like, you know, Deleuze and Guattari, much later in the late 70s and early 80s, wrote a book called A Thousand Plateaus. But the movement between uh, the plateaus are essentially uh, formations. There are things that are formed the war machine, the state, nomadic societies, you know, uh, capitalism in its different phases. So, politics, f successful um, establishment of political power or hegemony, as Gramsci would say, forms things. It forms political uh, formations, or in the language of, of a one of the most important Soviet philosophers, totally not translated, it forms a social tissue, like in, uh, like in a body. We have tissues, we have you know, differences in cells which function as, as structures, which are formed as the end product of a particular process, evolutionary process in the body or as a response to trauma or whatever. So in politics, we have these formations that are the results of political struggle and they solidify in, in time. They become the present. And they can stay that way if they're stable and they can reproduce themselves unless they are you know, destroyed or displaced or another formation is built next to it or, or, or on top of it or to the side of it, and, right? So this becomes a powerful metaphor, I think, in, um, in visualizing structure in politics you know, uh, more explicitly than perhaps the way the liberals talk about it in terms of rights and wrongs and, and kind of the, that kind of a language. Um, so I think this is the immediate background to the Gramsci uh, m military metaphors. But um, I mean, there's a lot to say. I just don't know. So maybe we should just focus on some sections and then uh, return to this idea of, um, I just want to say that for the study of, of if we want to study capital, or we want to study Marxist critique of political capitalist political economy, it's very difficult to study without knowing the basic dialectical, logical uh, structure that he borrows from Hegel. The same thing applies if we want to study Lenin's uh, notion of politics, which Gramsci follows explicitly uh, and builds on. Uh, there is something to be gained from the study of Hegel's science of logic for Marxists, but also for non-Marxist uh, sort of people in the orbit of Marxist thought. Because otherwise, we can't be rigorous in our understanding of their uh, theory. Of course, the theory is just a, a way of trying to study the reality, but the reality is too complicated to study without theory. Right? We, we can't study, you can't just understand American politics by saying, I'm going to understand American politics. Right? Uh, so that's why theory is so important. And just because Gramsci doesn't say words like dialectical logic or whatever, it doesn't mean that he did not already, he did study, obviously, Hegel's science of logic at the university. So I think this is just personally a point of weakness, like for me, um, I never studied the science of logic, you know, seriously. I'm, I'm doing it slowly on my own, and hopefully we'll have a... I'm doing it in, with my colleagues in Bulgaria at the university there who've been studying it for 50 years, and theoretically they're far beyond where I've been uh, So because of that. So this is something I, I want to put out. Um, so let's, let's just take a look at some of these sections in the uh, elements of politics. So let's start from there, and then we'll do the... Um, so page uh, 144 in the, uh, in the reader. It says the elements of politics. This is in the section on the modern prince. And I was thinking about w what to start with. Should we start with the war metaphors or should we start with this essay? And I think this might be a better place to start because Gramsci here asks the fundamental question, well, what is politics, right? So this is the question that all uh, influential thinkers about politics begin with, right? So Aristotle, what is politics? Um, Weber, what is politics? It, just to use examples of non-leftist or non-Marxists, uh, the Communist Manifesto, what is politics? Right, it's class struggle. What is politics in Aristotle? The quest for the good life, the full actualization of human beings collectively, because we can only fully actualize ourselves and reach our potential only in the context of a human community, because we are built that way. Right, we we're not self-sufficient as individuals. Um, so what is it for, what are the elements for Gramsci then in his reading of, of 
what is politics in the 1920s and 1930s. So just let's just read a little bit. So it, uh, at, the, at the very top, it really must be stressed that it is precisely the first elements, the most elementary things. And of course, uh, we're reminded that every time a, a philosopher, I just want to say philosophy, we're, we're using the word philosophy to mean uh, deliberate and careful and, and systematic thinking about thinking. So in other words, it's not like mathematical scientific thinking, which is thinking about objects that we are in a relation to. But thinking about thinking is essentially thinking about ourselves and how we exist, which is, which is an order of magnitude more difficult. So that's what he's saying here. It must be stressed that, that, and of course in philosophy, the most elementary things are the most fundamentally important and most difficult because they shape everything else that's built from them. Um, the most elementary things, which are the first to be forgotten. However, if they're repeated innumerable times, they become the pillars of politics and of any collective action whatsoever. So we need to constantly study the fundamental question, like what do we mean by politics today before we choose to do a particular politics? You know, what, what is it that I, I understand by politics? Uh, you know, Dr. Goebbels would agree completely. I mean, his contemporary, you know, who was very clear on this. The Nazis were very clear on this. They defined politics very clearly, you know, for example, uh, in the 20s. And the German Communist Party did not. The German Communist Party defined politics. You do politics because you want to build towards communist society. And that meant nothing to the average German at the time. And the Nazis said politics for us is a better everyday life for every German. That means you have a Volkswagen in the garage. If you can't afford a Mercedes, uh, that means, you know, so, so Gramsci is basically saying the revolutionary left has to come back to the question, what do we mean by politics? You know, what are we fighting for? So, and of course, what is there in politics that we need to recognize is fundamentally important? So the next sentence, the first most fundamental, uh, in other words, element is that there really do exist today, right, in his world, they really do exist rulers and ruled, leaders and led. You know, that's already an uncomfortable thing to say to the ears of 21st century kind of, you know, progressive people perhaps. And, you know, so this is very good. They're rulers and, and they're, not, they're not abusers and the abused. There are no victims and perpetrators of violence. They're rulers and the ruled. The entire science and art of politics are based on this primordial, irreducible fact. The origins of this fact are a problem, which is interesting already, because if you live through a society which has a revolutionary upheaval and the state has been captured by another political formation, like in Italy with the fascists, or like in Nicaragua in 79 with the Sandinistas, you know, the state all of a sudden became the politic, uh, was captured by another political formation. And then immediately the first criticism of the Sandinistas before long was they're starting to act in authoritarian fashion, just like the Soviets did. You know, Chavez, you know, censors newspapers. And Gramsci's saying one of the most uncomfortable and difficult parts about politics is that the politics that we inherit has evolved in a way that on the most fundamental level it has created hierarchies of leaders and followers. This is something we have to encounter. You know, um, he's not saying this is the way it is. You know, uh, the Nazis said that, right? Those who, those who prove themselves to be able to lead, can deservedly claim their position of leadership because they, it's very Hegelian. Also, they they negated the previous regime. They risked everything. Some of them died. They succeeded, and thus they can claim. You know, so you can read Hegel or Nietzsche. You know from the left and the right with equal equal validity in that sense. So, okay, so the entire science, okay, the origins of this fact are a problem apart, which will have to be studied separately, uh, but the fact remains that there do exist rulers and ruled leaders and led. So, okay, we don't like the situation as leftists, as Marxists or whatever, right? We don't want to live in a hierarchical society of, of, uh, of a ruling elite, perhaps, that has political force over the others. But Let's try to get there while still essentially surviving long enough to be able to get there. Right? So we have to confront this necessary evil. He's paraphrasing Machiavelli, the prince, here. Right? This is the first paragraph, the opening paragraph of Machiavelli's The Prince. This is why it's called The Modern Prince. 
right? So in the beginning of Machiavelli's The Prince, five, six hundred years before this, Machiavelli says, what is politics? And he says, well, um, I'm interested in looking at the politics that exist in the world today, not in a politics that might exist or should exist. He says, I like that too, but in this book I'm going to focus on the politics that exist today because I want to be able to affect the politics that exist today. So Gramsci is saying the same thing. I am uncomfortable and I do not like the politics of, uh, the, the fact that rulers and ruled are the elementary um, thing in politics, but I have to confront this right now because that's the political world I live in. Right? So this is an interesting entry point into how to deal with um, the oppressive nature of capitalist societies, which is highly, as we know, hierarchical and and rule and rule ruler ruled uh, oppressor oppressed to use the language of the, of the manifesto. Um, given this fact, right, it will have to be considered how one can lead most effectively given certain ends. So why do you do this, right? Given certain ends, hence how the leaders may best be prepared. And how, on the other hand, one can know the lines of least resistance or the most rational lines along with which to proceed if one wishes to secure the obedience of the rules ruled and the led. And here, I think, is an important sentence, the next sentence. In the formation of leaders, he's talking about the formation of, of his own political leaders, leaders, right? Not just his analysis of the fascist Mussolini's leaders. In the formation of leaders, one premise is fundamental. You know, this is the People's Forum is an incubator for leftist movements. This is the purpose of this space, right? So they are, oh, the Left Forum, the, sorry, the, the People's Forum is interested explicitly in the formation of left leadership of many different kinds, right? So they are, you know, they're, they're probably reading this too, you know, I hope. <laughs> in the formation of leaders, one premise is fundamental. Is it the intention that there should always be rulers and ruled? In other words, are you trying to create a society that way, but in a new way? new type of leaders and new type of followers? Um, or is the objective to create the conditions in which this division is no longer necessary? Personally, I think this is how I would answer today any criticism of, of, uh, of, of leftist politics in the past or in the present. So if somebody says the Chinese Revolution created modern day China with all of its hierarchies of rulers and ruled and you know or the Russian Revolution produced Stalin and you know all these things that's not the point the point of differentiation between and this is exactly why the difference between the Soviet Union you cannot equate the Soviet state and the Nazi state the way the European Union does mostly because a lot of them are former Nazi sympathizers <laughs> or the children of former um, is that Gramsci saying you want to really understand the, the political differences between various political struggles you have to look at the conditions towards which they're struggling. So the revolutionary communist movement struggles to hopefully figure out a way and move towards a society where the division between the rulers and the led is not necessary. This is their publicly stated goal, and that's true. The Nazi movement never aimed to create that kind of a world. The liberal movement never creates this kind of a world. Right? So this becomes a very powerful way to differentiate, for example, or th the anarchist movement is completely different from the liberal or Nazi political projects because anarchists move towards, as their stated goal, uh, a society where there are no f solidified hierarchies of power that are one, di one directional, flowing from top to bottom. So this is a very, I think, powerful and useful statement in everyday political conversation to when people say, well, you know, of course, even if you take political power today and establish hegemony in the United States and you're some kind of an anarcho-communist you know, political formation, you're just going to create a new FBI or you're going to create a new... Uh, and the answer is, yes, that may happen in the, in the course of this immediate political struggle, but the stated goal uh, uh, is, is, is a completely different end state. Now, whether, whether you're saying that just to be kind of polite uh, oh, fine, but if you're serious and you have written ma manifestos and, and documents of struggle, you know, that stuff is going to be clear because you wouldn't say it otherwise, right? So manifestos often are very honest documents, you know. Uh, you know, the Mussolini's documents are very honest about the fascist project. He didn't say we're going to create a society in Italy where we're going to deconstruct hierarchies of the ruled and the, and the, ru and the rulers. No, we're going to establish the correct hierarchy which are timeless and, you know, recapturing the Roman imperial sort of soul and, you know, whatever. 
the case it might be. Uh, Gramsci is saying this is how you differentiate between your political project and somebody else's project. What are the starting conditions that define what you want to arrive at to the best of your ability? Right? So it's not a trivial thing to be, made, to, to be made fun of when somebody says, ah, communism, right? Like you want to create a utopia where everybody can just go out fish in the evening and work in the... Well, yeah, that's what we want to do, at least in the beginning. Of course, our ideas might change. But these are, these are our politics, OK? We're not saying we have the truth, but to us it's true, so we can act accordingly. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of superficial and trivial to, uh, to not obey this sentence, Gramsci says. So this is what he does. He says, and by the way, this is, we've talked about Lukács, you know, these other names in history, like, um, you know, uh, Deng Xiaoping, I was reading one of his collected essays uh, recently, and, you know, you know, who, you know who's a, he could be qualified in the language of 20th century politics as a Stalinist, you know, strong centralized state, the political party is the state, you know, like in the Soviet Union, the same thing is true in China, you know, uh, it's similar to Nazism because the Nazi party was the state. But, but Deng Xiaoping and the new general, I'm not a supporter, but I'm not an, you know, I, I don't think China is becoming like the United States or something. But uh, in the latest Chinese state documents, it very clearly says uh, our stated goal is to trans transition to a different kind of a society, which is beyond capitalism, and then they have these qualifications. That has to be taken seriously, right? Uh, now, whether, whether how you're going to get there or when you're going to get there, if you're going to get there, nobody knows because you can't predict the future. You can just say no to what exists, right, as the rule today and move that way. So I think this is an important sentence. Uh, this is why also Gramsci went to the Soviet Union and, and participated in the, these congresses of the Third International, and he was criticized by anti-Stalinist leftists for doing that. Because to this day, if somebody is a Trotskyist, you know, Trotskyist leftists would say, Gramsci, we don't read Gramsci. They don't read Gramsci, which is a problem, <laughs> because he was a Stalinist. And by that they mean he did not critically enough or publicly enough confront the centralization of power that was happening in the Soviet state at the time. And what Gramsci would say, he would say, I did that because while we were undergoing an internal power struggle, which, yes, on a local level is foolish, right? It's, it's throwing people away from us who might have been not leftists but might have been sympathetic to us and we're arresting them and, you know. Um, he, but he said, I had to participate because I'm part of this larger political project which might take decades or centuries. This is for the same reason why, you know, uh, Lukács, you know, the, the great sort of Marxist thinker, revolutionary contemporary of, of he stayed in the Hungarian uh, state after 1956. He was kicked out, but, but he never, he didn't run away to Paris and hang out in the cafes, right? Like some of these dissidents did who were not, who were not revolutionaries on this level. He stayed there because he said, we are in movement. This is a process. And if you give up, you take yourself out of the game, and then you're no longer active in this project, you know? So this is an interesting question, like, or like Chavez, you know, when he's criticized for, uh, or the current president, where they establish censorship in the media, uh, which we want to move away from a state like that, right? We want to live in a society where there is no need for censorship of the media. But, but how do you think about it in the context of a political struggle, of a war in politics? You know, it's much more complicated, and it can end in disaster, and the revolution can just die or kill itself off. That can also happen like the French Revolution did, right? You know, Napoleon came up. Um, can I ask you something? Yeah. How does liberalism not um, hold, have the same pretensions? I think that liberalism... We, have, we, we, I think, we I think, I think cherish a society of individual freedom and rights. I think, I think politically powerful, uh, politically sophisticated liberal thinkers understand this very well. I think the, the, the weak political liberals who are in power today in the United States, for example, like the Democratic Party leadership, I think that's why they're not in power anymore, because they, they have got caught up in these superficial expressions of the political struggle, and they have lost sign of the elemental dynamics that their own society creates. So if you challenge uh, ruler, rule-based relationships in the corporate office, which manifest themselves, unfortunately, through sexual violence against women by men, if you say, this is horrible because this particular, th this misogynist exercised and they did something evil and you moralize it, but you do not challenge the relationship of 
power in the office that is expressed through gender relations, which, which are really expressed through class relations and the capitalist logic itself, then there's no way you can change it. You're just, you're just addressing, you're saying something very offensive to somebody who thinks that ruler-ruled relations are something totally normal for this society, which they are. And if your solution to that, to that if you say this relationship is really messed up, uh, but the way I'm talking about it is I'm making fun of it, or I'm basically making, I'm saying that it's, it shouldn't be here, but I'm not proposing an alternative, right? Your alternative is we're going to penalize with criminal penalties any man who violently imposes himself on a woman. That's not the fundamental problem here. The fundamental problem is you live in a society which is highly, not unequal, it's a society of the masters and slaves. That's the dynamic. You know, so why do you complain about a master exercising their power over a slave as if they're a bad person for doing it? The problem is much worse. <laughs> you know, the problem is that there is a master slave relation as the fundamental normal relationship in your society. You know, so um, in other words, if we go on, is the initial premise, right? So he's like a lot of uh, people would say, yes, is the initial premise the perpetual division of the human race? Right? So are the fascists really onto something here? Did they uncover some timeless part about human nature that we're just that kind of an animal, that we have to have a master-slave relationship? It's, not, it's, it's part of our evolutionary you know, being. Or the belief that this division is only a historical fact corresponding to certain conditions. So here's the division between, in his time, fascist slash liberal politics and the revolutionary left. Right? The fascists would say this is an evolutionary a result of human nature. We have evolved this way that there's always the superior and the inferior locked in a relationship that they both need but through the basis of a permanent hierarchy. And our job is to find this perfect hierarchy and make sure it's executed and then society will be healthy. You know, it'll be fine. Versus the rev the the uh, revolutionary left, you know, communist or anarchist who basically say no, this is the product of historical conditions which might be 2,000 years old but it doesn't mean that in the next 5,000 years we have to obey the same relationship just because it's pa it happened in the past you know all right yet it must clearly be understood that the division between rulers and ruled which in the last analysis of course for Gramsci is a division between social groups is in fact things that are also to be found within the group itself even where there is a socially homogeneous group. So, of course, not only are we in a master-slave relationship between capitalists and, and workers or between, uh, you know, men and women at the workplace or whatever the case might be, we're also in a master-slave relationship within women, within gender itself, or within class, or within, you know, the, uh, the, the, the other divisions uh, of society. And then we have to skip things because, unfortunately, but um, so on the next page, 145, the first paragraph at the top, um, let's just, I'm just going to read the sentence before that on the bottom of 144. In a certain sense, it may be said that the division is created by the division of labor. It's merely a technical fact. And those who see everything purely in terms of technique, technical necessity, speculate on this coexistence of different causes in order to avoid the fundamental problem. Since the division, I think this is an important paragraph, since the division between rulers and ruled, exists even within the same group, i.e. within the communist, the left movement. You know, these relationships will form. Either, depending on what you believe, because that's human nature, or because we grew up in a world of hierarchy, and we just recreate that hierarchy as we live it, even if we try to change it. Even within the same group, certain principles have to be fixed upon and strictly observed. For it is in this area that the most serious errors take place and that the most criminal weaknesses and the hardest to correct are revealed. For the belief is common that obedience must be automatic once it is a question of the same group. Democratic centralism, right, in the Leninist party was interpreted this way once the party became in power. We have debates in this room, but once we vote, if you disagree with our course of action, the majority, democratic, the majority, it's democratic in the real sense, the Aristotelian sense, right? That you don't vote for somebody. You participate, and by casting a vote, you take a position. But whatever the majority decides, you must obey its will, even if it contradicts your very principles. So he says, uh, For it is in this area that the most serious errors take place. 
For the belief is common that obedience must be automatic once it is a question of the same group, and that not only must it come about without any demonstration of necessity or rationality being needed, but it must be unquestioning. Some believe, and what is worse, act in this belief that obedience will come without being solicited, without the path which has to be followed being pointed out. This is an incredibly important, I think, section because this exposes the central concept in Machiavelli, uh, in, in, in Gramsci about politics, which is that in modern politics, at least, in order to win in a political struggle, you have to try to win through hegemony. You have to obtain the obedience of others. Consent. You have to create the leadership ruled hierarchy through consent as much as possible. And the minute you vote, a or B, you're consenting to be ruled. You're consenting to be ruled, but you do not automatically switch off and basically say, I voted, I didn't win, but I'm going to obey the, the president or the general secretary or whatever, right? Because I'm a member, I've, I had my chance, I voted, I did, we debated, now I have to obey because otherwise it, it's not going to work. He's saying, no, that's not the way, that's not the best way. The best way is to keep channels open within the organization where you still have to revisit what just happened. Things have to make sense. Things have to make sense for people to commit to them fully, right? So if you're gonna win and risk your life to do something, it has to make sense. You, you, you have to say to yourself, yeah, I wouldn't do it this way, but, and I don't agree with it, but I understand why it's happening, and I understand precisely because those who are now in a position of leadership because they won the vote, we kept having this, this interaction, right, after the vote happened, and I've come to the conclusion that, okay, I don't agree with it, but I understand why it's happening. So it has to be based on understanding, right? So political organizations have to have this kind of dialectical, um, uh, the process of negation has to be allowed to continue inside, you know. So we don't know exactly know how to do it, but this is the challenge in, in the organizational form, you know. So this is, this is a very interesting passage uh, about how should we organize a political organization which maintains uh, the notion of democratic participation, which has discipline and unity of, of action, but which also builds consent at the same time, and it doesn't just become an automatic mechanical event whereby you just recreate a master-slave ruler-ruled hierarchy automatically but in a different way. And then you hate the people you know, like what happened in the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s, and by the 80s it was too late, and they just gave up, they just became capitalists, is that you went to these meetings and you debated something important, and then everybody voted, everybody had to vote yes, because if you voted no, 30 years before that it was already like weird or dangerous, right? So everybody mm -hmm. voted yes, and then it just became kind of like an empty thing. And, and then the leadership did its thing and had power, and the lead became this passive body that didn't really think or didn't involve itself in the, in the process. So when Yeltsin and Gorbachev basically called the dissolution of the Soviet state, nobody from that party went on the street to fight uh, and, and preserve the state because it wasn't worth preserving to them. One and a half million Soviet Communist Party members, thousands showed up to fight for the Soviet Union at the end, right? So that's what happens when uh, political power on the level of the state functions without consent. It just becomes very weak and brittle, you know, and it can be taken over by other forces. And, and I think the root of this concept of hegemony, uh, you can find in here as well in this, uh, in this passage. So there are many other uh, interesting things, but um, um, so just to review for a little bit. So the state in Gramsci is the unity of civil and political society, and the state functions in the modern political context, especially in capitalist societies like Italy and, and you know, the powerful capitalist liberal states, it functions through hegemony. It functions through a combination of consent and coercion. But the consent is a bigger part than the coercive part. It's like the United States, right? This regime functions through hegemony very successfully, right? So there may be, uh, in the 1960s, in Elaine Brown, the Black Panthers, and a few million people who supported her politics and actively fought in the freedom movement and the union movement and the women's rights movement and anti-Vietnam movement. But the vast majority of the society, or maybe not the vast majority, but maybe the, a majority of society, um, was absolutely fully okay with the explanations 
that were coming from the American state about what America is and where we're going. So it's a you very stable society. You can't talk about majority in, in our society as constituted by the, by the Constitution because hmm. the, the uh, government that rules us is fostered by a minority. The Absolutely majority true. is ruled out of consent. Well, so 56 percent, 60 percent of the American public disagrees with what the government is doing. So it's right. not giving its consent. Absolutely, well. uh, so you're right. But what Gramsci would say, he's not. In, he's not. He's never. We never study politics through the lens of liberal elections, right? Through voting or you know these things. The problem is resistance. Is there? Are there people willing to say no in a way that risks? their X and Y, their house, their home, their, their freedom, right? Uh, are there sufficient numbers of people on the street or otherwise who send a clear signal that they're negating the message that's coming down from the American state? What is that sufficient number? Uh, one example would be, for example, um, recent history or, or in the 50s and 60s? From there on. Okay. So sufficient number would be, I, I think in America it never really reached sufficient numbers. In France it did, for example, in 1968, that would be an example. Most of these people on the streets in 1968 in Paris were not necessarily communist, Maoist, liberal, fascist, uh, 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 political, professional political activists or revolutionaries or even, right? But they had the sense that I don't want things to continue the way they are. I'm not going to go to work today. I'm going to do this now. Right, and in France, that was a sufficient number of people who decided to um, expose them to, to some kind of a risk in this political sense that they withdrew their consent from the state in sufficient numbers that the president had to flee the country and kind of wait. They go, you know, fled to Germany in a military base and kind of had to wait because they could have killed him, for example, or they could have arrested him. I mean, that's what he was thinking. Whether, of course, there was no danger of that happening, but he didn't know that. Uh, in the United States, we haven't been that lucky. I mean, we haven't been that, you know, it hasn't been that lucky. <laughs> but, but that's a testament to the power and the sophistication of the American state yeah. and the people who, 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 who carefully maintain their hegemony over time. You know, we can make fun of Trump and whatever, but these people are incredibly formidable uh, students of politics. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so successful. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, beside having a critical number, Chris Hedges also indicates that you have to have a certain critical mass of those who are deploying the coercion, that i.e. the military and the police, right. also come over to the side of, right. of the revolutionaries. That's a very well. important point. When the members of the state, when the members of the political community, when the members of the repressive apparatus yes. uh, of the state... Which is what happened in Eastern Europe. Yes, change over, then it's, it's truly over. Yes. Um, yeah, then, then that's, or the military or whatever the case, it, it might be right. So that's one way to even more effectively measure the withdrawal of hegemony, mm -hmm. which again in the United States is a very stable political system. I mean, the people who created the American political system were masters of, of politics, you know, to use the, 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 the language of race and all these other ways to divide uh, and whatever else they did. So just one more thing before we go to the war metaphors. Uh, on page, because it follows what we just talked about, about the par political party, on page uh, 152, Gramsci has this incredibly interesting description of the three parts that exist in a political party or a political organization, right? So he says, in order to have a political move party that is capable of affecting uh, uh, qu questions like hegemony, a political party that is powerful enough to, to be a factor, uh, in the state. It has, it has to contain these three elements, right? So he says the first element is the mass element, composed of ordinary average people whose participation takes the form of discipline and loyalty rather than any creative spirit or organizational ability. So a well-functioning political party, you don't have to use the word party, you can use movement or whatever. Uh, a well-organized and well-meant and, and, and carefully thought through political movement has to contain a mass element. Right? Of course, he's paraphrasing uh, sort of the, uh, Lenin's party. Lenin's party was explicitly created thinking these three, three points. You know, this was the innovation of, 
of the Leninist Revolutionary Party as it was different from the Liberal Party. So we have to make this distinction here, which is, okay, without these mass members, in other words, these are the people who believe in the project, they give you their consent, we agree with your ideas, and we will do our part, but we're not necessarily going to risk everything, we're not necessarily going to be expected to produce explanations for others, you know, we're going to, in other words, we're going to fit in in the way that we fit in best. And the organization has to find those people and welcome them and kind of give them a home because otherwise these people are going to not do politics or the fascists will take care of them and they'll go that way. Right? So it becomes like, a, like getting the votes, you know what I mean, kind of a thing. Um, so without these mass members, the party would not exist. It wouldn't have the numbers. It is true, but it is also true that neither could it exist without these alone. Uh, this is a typical kind of Marxist dialectical sort of Hegelian sort of thing. You need this. Without this, you can't have the whole. Yeah. But only if this is the whole, it's not going to be the whole either. Necessary but not sufficient. Exactly. Necessary but not sufficient. Necessary but not sufficient. But not sufficient. Yeah. The Irish Republican Army excelled at this also on their own level. I read this biography of one of the provisional IRA founders, and he gave this extraordinary example. In the early mid-70s, he was in a van on a mission, you know, this was the time of troubles and there was a war against the British occupation. And they had a car bomb, essentially, that they were going to park by the headquarters of the military police the, and it was going to blow up. I mean, this was their mission, right? So these were not, they were not the mass element members, right? These were the, the principal cohesive element, right? These two guys, they're driving the van with the, they're, oh, they're supposed to go to the gas station and pick up the bomb, right? And put it in the car, fertilizer or whatever. You know, the IRA pioneered car bombs. <laughs> and uh, b because, you know, of what was happening in, in Ireland, or there, the British were using military force and they couldn't just have, uh, you know, we should say for YouTube that, that you know, the, uh, the Irish Republican Army campaign in this time of troubles in the 60s started as a defensive act when, when Protestant gangs, blessed by the British authorities, started entering Catholic neighborhoods in Northern Ireland and committing massacres, yeah. right? This is ex exactly why that movement happened. It didn't happen because the IRA, because of its violent politics, decided to, you know, foment, you know, car bombs or whatever. Um, so these people go to the gas station and th they're supposed to pick up the bomb, he says, this uh, co-founder of the provisional. But the problem is the bomb was too big. Two people couldn't do it in time. It would have taken them an hour to move all the bags. They're like 14 bags or something. And, but they don't have time because it's 5 in the morning. and you know. So they look around. There's nobody there except two kids like playing on the street, like 10-year-old, 9-year-old, or four kids or something, like a group of children. And they basically said, look, we're going to have to ask you to do something, but you can't tell anybody about this. You're gonna well, we're going to have to ask you to move these bags into the van, okay? We need your help. We can't do it without you, and it's very important. Don't ask what it is. You know, just don't tell anybody. And they're like, okay. <laughs> so these totally random kids in, you know, move these bags, and they're able to do it in 14 minutes instead of an hour or whatever. And then I don't know what happened. I think the bomb didn't explode because there was a problem in the wiring or whatever. Uh, 40 years later... This person is released from jail. Like he spent like 20 years in jail and whatnot. The war's over, right? There's the peace accords, and uh, so he walks back and he's having kind of his walk back through his old neighborhood, and and he walks by, past by this gas station, and he kind of meets these like two guys, you know, young guys, you know. And he was a famous person in Northern Irish politics, so people knew his face, and and they stop and they're like. You know, we know you, and, but you probably don't remember us. And he's like, no, you know. He said, we were those two, those kids back in 19, you know. And he said, we just want to let you know, we haven't told anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, they were the mass members of the party. They were not uh, committed like in, in, on that level, but they were committed on another level, right? So this is true. Uh, this is true for the Democratic Party too, or the Republican Party today, right? We have, they have their mass element that votes, that just goes and votes, yeah. right? That's their mass element. Um, but then there's the principal cohesive element, which is another requirement, which centralizes nationally, centralizes nationally, and renders effective and powerful a complex of forces which left to themselves would count for little or nothing. So it's a synchronization. This is the HQ, right? So this is the military metaphors here, begin. 
you need some kind of a centralizing element, not because you believe in centralization of the master-slave relationship, but because it's more efficient. It allows you to pull together different ideas and logistical things and to actually make them happen. So you have responsibilities of hierarchies. You do this, you do that. You commit to doing this, so you're gonna do it. But I'm committing because I can do it. I have the special skill or, or commitment or knowledge. Um, this element is endowed with great cohesive, centralizing and disciplinary power. Also, and indeed this is the basis for the others, with the power of innovation. Again, innovation is a form of negation, right? You, you, you think outside of the box, if you will. <laughs> innovation, be it understood in a certain direction, according to certain lines of force, certain perspective, even certain premises. So you have to be innovative, right, in the political organization. You have to have, be centralized, but only centralization where it makes sense on this level and not on the mass level, right? Uh, it is also true that neither could this element form the party alone. However, it could do so more than that could the first element considered by itself. One speaks of generals without an army, but in reality it is easier to form an army than to form generals. That's interesting. Because generals, there's the intellectual excellence that needs to be cultivated in a certain way. So much is this true that an already existing army is destroyed if it loses its generals, while the existence of a united group of generals who agree among themselves and have common names soon creates an army even when none exists. Right? So this is an interesting... So if you want to form a movement, he's saying, you need to have at least two components in the movement. There's a mass movement, which he defines in a very specific way, and there's the principal cohesive uh, element that whatever you want to call it, you know. The leadership, or if you don't like that word, you can call it some other word. Uh, but essentially, this is the Leninist model in its <coughs> classical uh, formation, right? Uh, Lenin called their, their party the army party, or the armed party. So it had these divisions of labor uh, and, and three large interlocking circles of, of movement. And all the other, most of the other 20th century revolutionary movements have replicated, that were successful. And they were they were successful, meaning they were able to ha do politics on the level of the state. You know, they were not very tiny and, and sort of diluted in the. Of course, the Nazis did this too. They understood this perfectly. You know, the liberals do it too. I mean, this is a general truth that Gramsci is saying about pol political organization in the 20th century. You know. Um, and lastly, an, an uh, intermediate element, which articulates the first element with the second, the connective, the glue, right? and maintains contact between them, not only physically, but also morally and intellectually. In reality, for every party, there exist fixed proportions between these three elements. So we got to find the proportions for our own conditions and, and politics. And the greatest effectiveness is achieved when these fixed proportions are realized. In the language of philosophy, this is basically the Hegelian triad of the universal, the particular, and the uh, uh, singular. Right? So Hegel described how we think, how we understand ourselves in the world through the interaction of these three uh, concepts: the singular, the particular. Uh, sorry, the, that's the same thing. The, the singular, the uh, universal, and the um, particular. What does that mean? In the language of Marx, it becomes how people understand the money-capital money relationship, depending on what social class they're in. So if I'm a capitalist, my relationship to money is different than if I'm a worker. It's the same money, but to me it means different things, right? So for example, the basic relationship uh, for a capitalist on the question of money is, as we know from Marx's volume two of Capital, is money is exchanged. Money is being used as capital, which means it's exchanged for a commodity. And that commodity itself then is exchanged for more capital. Right? So this is the MCM prime movement, which is an explanation of how capital functions in a capitalist society in Marx's time. Right? So from that point of view, uh, if I have a capitalist and I look at my money, I look at my bank account and I, I say, uh, these $3 million I'm going to convert into capital. I'm going to spend <coughs> in a special way because I want to increase my wealth. So I look at the $3 million and that's not a, that's, I, that the money is not a, um, is that a universal thing for me in that case? No, it's a particular thing. It's something that is, I'm using in a specific way. It, I'm using it as capital, so I, I invest it. 
I create a business, I buy commodities, a building of workers, machines, and I sell coffee, right? I exchange my particular, this particular thing called money as capital into something that's functioning as a universal in my society. I'm creating a business that sells coffee to whoever wants to buy it and drink it. But then I don't end there. Then the process, whatever that universal is, the commodity, the coffee that is sold by Starbucks to the customers, is converted into money because they can only get it in exchange for money. And that money enters my bank account, more of it than I put in, now that money becomes singular thing. It becomes my money only, and it's privately withdrawn into my bank. So this is an example of how Marx uses, uh, can, under, can understand and decipher the movement of capital use in a rigorous and clear way using the Hegelian logical system. Like, what moves you to do this? Well, it's this movement of the... And of course, if I'm a worker, I have a different relationship. I start with... Uh, I don't start with money. That's the problem. I start with a commodity, <laughs> yeah. just myself and my ability to sell myself for money, right? So I start with something that is... So anyway, so, so I think Gramsci is, is sort of... Uh, in, a, in his own way is thinking about the what is the universal element in the political party what is the singular what is the particular and it depends on who you are in the organization uh, it's going to be a different thing right so this is a very in kind of a uh, abstract but also very um, immediately useful way of thinking about the organization yeah it, it, to use another Hegelian category it seems that the intermediate element is also serving as a form of mediation between it's all about mediation, movement. yes. So, and we should say that in Hegel and Marx, these are not mechanical things. In other words, there is no rule that the media, the middle of the three, is always going to be the particular or always going to. No, they can they can interchange. The middle component, the thing that stands in the middle of this and this and connects the two, could be the particular, the singular, or the universal. Any three of them, depending on the circumstances of what is being talked about or what is happening, mm -hmm. right? So so. Um, but it's, it's about mediation. What mediates? Mediation, if you think about it, is a way of getting, gaining access, exchanging access. You know, you can exchange money, but that money could mean access, or it could mean other things, or it could mean many different things. You know, um, the, um, you can analyze the Russian Revolution as a, as, a, as a mediating factor, too. The Soviet state was a, was a, was a mediating connective tissue uh, to something else that was desired, but that thing disappeared, or they the, the connection was severed, you know, somehow. So this is a powerful way to that I think we have forgotten in 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 Marxist sort of um, studies, because it's not enough, for example, to read Volume One of Capital in order to understand capital, the, the logical underpinnings of capital. Volume One of Capital, which begins with the study of the commodity, is important because that's how we perceive the world. We see the world as a collection of commodities, right? You walk around, you see advertisements, everything is for sale. There's always the urge to buy something, to consume something, right? That's the reality that we live in. So Marx starts with something that is immediately understood by everyone as real, the most. But reality can also have an appearance of something that it's not. It can have multiple, you know, there could be an appearance. And, they, and then you've got a volume two and you understand the same reality but in a different way, right? So this becomes the way you study something. It's a German philosophy, basically. I mean, an intensification of ancient Greek thought. You know, so we read Heidegger. It's it's obsessive kind of ways of looking at things in, from different angles and different layers, and and you know, um, and Gramsci's doing the same what thing. What Marx here. is doing is demystifying the commodity. He's taking its yes. religious, mystical overturn overtures and demystifies it so that we can see it as the parts that go into it, the product, right. the material, the labor, right. the social but, relationship. But he also, held, he also holds that the, the, the commodity is real. In other words, it's a, it has mystical quantity qualities, the way we think about it. We ascribe it these kinds of things. And, well, that's you know, the appearance. Right, but the appearance is also simultaneously real. In other words, it's, it's something that we can uh, viscerally, ephemerally, and corporeally touch. Right? The commodity is real, but at the same time is also uh, immaterial. It's, it also has this other... Uh, and social relations yeah. that create Yeah. So this is what liberal political thought, for example, cannot handle. But that's okay, because they have power. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they, they have hegemony. In other words, we are too weak, because we... Actually, it's not even that simple. But, you know, it's, it is possible that the Marxist understanding today is obsolete. I'm just going to throw that out.
I know people uh, I've been speaking to who have said, that, like my friends uh, uh, in Bulgaria, that they, who've done this incredibly profound deconstruction of Capitals, Volume 1 through 3. Um, there are elements of Marxist analysis were stuck in the 19th century because he was a person of the 19th century, but today things are more complicated, and we Amen. need to update. Amen. We need to update the um, the in, the classic insights without abandoning the the uh, as the rigor. Paston does. As who? As Paston. Moshe Paston. Oh, Paston. Yeah, yeah. Yes. He, he's who's written incredibly important. Yes. Kind of searching for the for the what's relevant today and what, what can we keep and what can we yes, discard from exactly. um, so let's let's maybe we'll let's go to the war because we only have like 45 minutes but let's go back to, to the war metaphors now and then we can go, go back and forth so in in the section we just discussed and we can summarize by saying that Gramsci was very attuned to a couple of fundamental things about doing politics, which is we have to understand and figure out what are the fundamental elementary parts that move the politics, that make of the politics of our time. That's the starting point. He identified the master slave, the ruler ruled relationship as being of fundamental importance. We have to work with that because we also do that, right? Uh, and, and how do we make sense of that? How do we do politics while where we are shaped by the thing that we don't want to be as we try to move away from it. You know? So that's, that's kind of an interesting and important insight. And then the second insight is um, a political organization has at least three levels of organization according to function. Why is that necessary? I don't, why was that necessary? Uh, why is it three elements instead of not one? Um, I think the answer to that comes to if we think about sort of the war metaphors and also what, how is politics done in his time. I think you'll see that it requires this kind of specialization because the scale of politics is so huge now. You know, it's everybody's included in politics. Politics is everywhere in the modern world, whereas it was not before the French Revolution, right? Like you could live in your village and it was probably a very good life in some way compared to 19th century life in, in the same society because you could kind of be a master of your own <coughs> life and be sort of not be subjected to the greater political movements of the queendom or the, you know, uh, whatever. But in the 20th century, politics penetrate, it's total, it's total, it's totalized, it's a totalitarian or totalizing uh, element of everyday life. You know, Trotsky's saying, you know, I mean, others have said it, but you may not be interested in politics, but politics is definitely interested in you, mm -hmm. you know, so you can't disengage, you know. Mm. So, um, so let's go to the war metaphors now, which are another very interesting part of Gramsci, which I think are often read in a little bit of a narrow, uh, through a narrow lens. So page 229 is where it begins. Uh, uh, let's see, what shall we say and what shall we not, because there's so much... So Gramsci is writing at the end of, in the aftermath of World War I and uh, af in the midst of the Depression, right? So the Russian Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, which of course we may not think about it uh, on the same level as the Russian Revolution, but it was actually longer lasting and uh, in many ways just as transformational. You know? and, uh, I think in Mexico to this day, uh, huge chunks of the, of the country are not cannot belong to private. There's no large landowners in Mexico by law since the revolution. Is that still true? Yeah. Or, or can they rent the land now? Or well, do they, 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 I mean, they've chipped away a, a lot away. of it. Um, but, and actually, a lot of the, the, the Ejido mm -hmm. uh, uh, principle was after the, the period of the actual revolution, which was from 1910 to 1920. 20, yeah. um, a lot of the Ejido stuff came uh, as a result of Lazaro Cardenas's Cardenas, yeah. Uh, yeah. presidency in the, in the 1930s. 30s, yeah. That was when he nationalized the oil and basically re redistributed all the land, the land. to uh, indigenous groups, yeah. and they owned them collectively. 
to this day. To this day, oh yeah, in Guerrero, probably 90% of the land right. is owned. And that, I mean, indirectly, that's that would not have been possible without the Mexican Revolution. No. Right? I no, mean, the no. Latifundia, no. large owners, would, yeah. landowners would have. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's an, that's an incredibly major event in early 20th century, I mean, the Mexican Revolution, right. you know, in, in, in this part of the world. Um, so, so why is Gramsci using these war, war concepts, the war of maneuver and war of politics? So this always becomes like an interesting initial question. Like you're writing about politics, why do you use the metaphors or the connections to war? And the question is because in liberal political philosophy, which is dominant, right, because of the, uh, its influence is so enormous as capitalism became sort of the global, the predominant system of political economic organization, the, the foundational work is Hobbes's Leviathan. Right, and in Hobbes's Leviathan, um, you know, a great work of, of, of politics and the question of politics, Hobbes says, in some way, Hobbes says, politics is the absence of war and war is the absence of politics. So the, he sets up this uh, negation of one or the other. But, but it's, it's, it's sort of a, um, they're like mirror opposites in a certain sense, right? He says, look, the whole purpose of, of politics is we want to get out of a state of war because a state of war is a state where we cannot actualize, we can't function as humans. You know, the famous passage, life is very short, nasty, brutal, you know, there's violence. State of nature. State of, we revert back to uh, like an, almost a non-human or, or, or an earlier stage of human development phase. You know, everything is about survival, you know? And Hobbes said, that's not what you wanna be living through. You know, you wanna live in, through the absence of war. So you create these things, you even surrender your freedom temporarily to the government, to the state, uh, who then has the solemn responsibility to avoid war, you know. Uh, and if they can't, well, they're going to be removed and the cycle will repeat. A lot of people will die and the economy will collapse and life will be pointless. And so in liberal politics to this day, like, you know, the U.S., for example, or any liberal state, defines war as kind of a state of exception. You know, there's like, we're in a war now, now we're in a state of peace. And why? Because we declared a war and we're in a war or, you know, this is happening. And, but Hobbes had another definition of, of the war phase, which was very complicated. He said, war actually does not need to be measured by fighting alone. You know, you could be in a state of war and there could be no bombs falling at all. But you, but you are in a state of war as long as you think that the possibility of violence exists relative to you. So by that definition, war is politics, right? So Hobbes kind of just said both things, you know. Uh, like all, you know, great thinkers, everything was contradictory at, always at the same time. So Gramsci is basically, uh, Machiavelli, you know, he's the person he looked up to philosophically as an Italian predecessor who has also wrote about the war and, and, and in similar ways. So Gramsci's asking the question, so wait a minute, we had World War I, this incredible carnage. Uh, we have the Fordist economy. Um, does this possibly affect politics? I mean, what is politics and what is war? What is the relationship between the two? And, um, and um, <clears throat> he comes to the conclusion, and I think one of the places we can find is on page 230. Um, he gives a, these complicated examples from, from German history and from European history, from World War I and, and so on and so forth. But he says, if you look at these complicated struggles in France, the German nationalist right and coup d'etats, and he says, it is that evident that in these forms of mixed struggle, fundamentally of a military character, but mainly fought on the political plane, um, though in fact every political struggle always has a military substratum the use of commando squads and you know secrecy and, and so on and so forth so in other words Gramsci comes to the conclusion that uh, we have to seriously ask the question what is the relationship between war and, and politics is this the relationship between war and peace you know war is the absence of, of, of politics or is it some kind of a change of phase you know it's the same thing but it's just done differently and the first example that he's thinking is the 19th century, you know, Prussian uh, military uh, general, the general and, and military theorist uh, von Clausewitz, you know, who wrote this big book on war, which became very influential, who was trained in, he listened to Hegel's lectures, you know, 
he attended Hegel's lectures in Berlin, Clausewitz as a young Prussian officer, and he was philosophically trained. So Clausewitz said, actually, the best way to think about war and politics is that uh, you know, uh, war is the continuation of politics through other means, right? So it's the deployment of uh, by the state of tools that are different from other tools. So instead of elections or you know whatever the case might pa passing laws and enforcing laws, now you're going to use the most uh, uh, violent coercive arm of the state, the military, to achieve your political goals. Mm. By the way, Foucault, in the 70s, early 70s, in lectures reading Gramsci and Clausewitz, reverses Clausewitz, right? Because he read Gramsci. And he says this interestingly, he says, um, he says, of course, we can say that actually war, uh, politics is the continuation of war through other means. We can think about it that way as well. And then just a few quotes from Foucault to sort of show uh, the influence of Gramsci before we go to Gramsci. So Foucault says, the role of political power then, so what is politics, is perpetually, so constantly, to use a sort of silent war to uh, rewrite that relationship of force and to reinscribe it in its institutions, economic inequalities, language, and even the bodies of individuals. So politics is war. It requires this constant deployment of force, which we call war because that's where it's most clearly forceful, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it uses that constantly to renew itself, to maintain relationships of rulers and ruled uh, in everywhere, in language, in the bodies of people, and its institutions, which is kind of a striking sentence of clarity from Foucault, like how clearly he understood what politics is. Um, uh, and then there's another cool quote by Foucault, a very powerful one. Uh -huh. So he says, you may think, as liberal thinkers today would think in his time, uh, that uh, power and uh, politics and war are different things. But he says politics actually reproduces the fundamental uh, functioning of power found in war. You know, it's, it's the same thing, but expressed a little bit differently. Uh, when thinking of times of peace, Foucault said, if you think that you're not in a state of war, but you're in a state of peace, he says, he says, within this civil peace, these political struggles, these clashes over or with power, these modifications of relations of force, you know, the word power in English, by the way, we should say, is, a, is a unfortunate. Because the word power, um, maybe it's not the best word to use in English. Maybe force is a better Agency. word. Agency or agency through force, or, or just agency. Because in the French, it's about force. In Russian, I know, it's the word power doesn't exist. It's, liter it's understood that it's about force, compelling others, or initiating a movement through resistance, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so within the civil peace, these political struggles, these clashes over with power, these modifications of relations. So what is p politics in Foucault's language? I mean, he's paraphrasing Machiavelli, you'll see. It's, it's uh, engagements in how you wield relations of force. That's on the most elementary level, that's politics. You can't do politics if you don't project force. Because the force will be projected against you and you're just gonna take it and you won't be able to, to, to move. You won't be able to move, literally. Uh, you know, intellectually or physically or any other way. So the shifting balance, the reversals in a political system, all these things must be interpreted as a continuation of war. Why war? Because war, preoccupies itself with relations of force, forcing the other side to move or to disappear or, you know, to give up. And they are interpreted as so many episodes, fragmentations, displacements of the war itself. We're always writing the history of the same war, even when we're writing the history of peace and its uh, institutions. Just to add one more example, Gramsci's contemporary that he criticizes a little bit here, Rosa Luxemburg had a famous statement about constitutions and the law. She said, every constitution, every law is simply the ossified result of a previous violent encounter of force. So the US Constitution is simply the codified wishes of the winning faction in that war, in that political fight, which one, imposed its will, wrote the Constitution, and enforced it, and then enforced society to become what the Constitution wants it to become, right? So the law itself is just a temporary marker of somebody's political victory, you know, uh, which is kind of a powerful thing about Rosa's understanding of, of, uh, of politics at its core. Yeah, this, it's interesting that, that I mean, in Bonwin's yacht, uh, the 
leader of the uh, Vietnamese Communist, one of the leaders of the Vietnamese Communist Party. Um, his view was that politics would, a actually politics was the prime thing, because yeah, you're doing you're doing military, you know, you you you're using military means, but really what you're exerting is is political, right. and if you don't have the political, then you and can't. it's a very good point because the question will arise to return to Gramsci, you know. Why do people fight in war? And there are many reasons why right. people have risked their lives or people have been put there. You know, people, but that's not the important point. The important point is how people have fought in war in different wars. So if you look, for example, France versus Germany, 1939, 1940. People have always asked, why is it that the French military collapsed so quickly? And the answer is because there was no will to fight. They did not see the Nazis as an existential problem enough people in the French military. It's not about the exhaustion of World War I. The, the Germans were exhausted too. You know, their previous generation was exhausted in World War I. Why is it that only, you know, 3% uh, of the French population participated in the resistance against the Nazis? Occupation of their own country. That's an absurdly low percentage. That's the most optimistic number, 3% that the French historians, 300,000 people participated in the French resistance as one of Gramsci's three levels. Uh, most of them were like, low-level, you know, helpers. There was a core who died, you know, and, and then, but, but why is it that in other parts of, of, of World War II, much larger percentages of the population engaged in the war, in that kind of politics, like in Greece, um, in, 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 in the Soviet Union, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in Yugoslavia, yeah. uh, in the Soviet Union, where after 20 million people casualties, the, the, the state did not collapse. That's an extraordinary, uh, or in Korea in 1950-53. Forty percent of the population was killed. Forty percent of the Kore North Korean population died in three years. The state did not collapse. I can't think of a higher level of legitimacy of a political project than, than having withstood that test, you know, I mean, if you think about it. But the same thing could be said about the Nazi army. There was not a single large-scale rebellion or mutiny against Hitler in the German military en masse. You had a plot that involved officers 20 people, 20, 100 people, whatever. But so you're talking about, um, uh, you know, hegemony is, is incredibly important. It provides this incredible consent, which can be uh, converted into massive force in, in, in a political context, you know. Um, so, okay, so I was going to read another quote by Foucault, but that would, that would take it. So Gramsci then says, okay, so he says, if we think about war, um, we have to ask ourselves the question, how are wars fought? And he says, there's two ways, elements of war in his time. And this is incorrect, by the way, uh, in the 19... Well, it's correct, but it's becoming incorrect, uh, as we shall see. But it's interesting. So Gramsci says there's two ways to fight a war, by deploying maneuver and by deploying uh, kind of a p positional warfare. And what does he mean? So he summarizes, basically, war since Napoleon's time. So in Napoleon's time, French Revolution, 1800s, um, wars were fought through maneuver. The idea was... If you fight against another state, like the Prussian state, or the Russian state, or the British state, and you're the French state, you mobilize the most forceful part of your state, the military, and you try to destroy the other state by literally physically destroying them or displacing them. But how are you going to do that? You have to compel them to a general battle, a single fundamentally important battle, everybody against everybody else. The main forces, you have to force the other side to accept the battle because that's how this is going to get decided. You're going to clash in one decisive battle, and whoever wins that battle will basically win the war itself and impose their will on the other state because there will be no force left to challenge it effectively. Napoleon did this through maneuver, meaning he would compel the other side to meet them on a field, but then he would not fight sort of, you know, a line against a line sort of arranged I mean, of course, that would be part of the battle, but the idea was for the battle to conclude quickly, like in a day, if possible. So he would do everything that he could to structure and find some way to increase the speed of the battle so it happens quickly and it's decisive, it's shocking, maybe by surprise, and it's over, right? So this became known as the um, uh, war, war of Maneuver of Napoleon, which focuses, focused on a single decisive battle. And once you can force this battle and win it quickly, the war is decided. You know, you could be hundreds of miles away from, from the other state. It doesn't matter. 
This is, by the way, why he couldn't conquer Russia, because the Russian commander-in-chief, the Marshal Kutuzov, refused to give the battle, because he understood that too. So he kept taking advantage of Russia's territory and he kept retreating. And Napoleon said, why don't you want to give me the battle? And he said, because we would probably lose. And if we lose, we would lose the state. So the Russians never joined the battle. There were small battles, uh, and then eventually Napoleon withdrew. Right? So this becomes kind of a thing. Then technology advances in the 19th century, the American Civil War, makes battles of single battles impossible because you have trains, you have massive armies, and you have multiple battles that are being fought now by the states at any given time. So then slowly the war of maneuver becomes impossible or secondary and becomes a fight of position, meaning you have trenches, you have hills, you have geographical features outside of cities where you have concentrated battles in war. Right? This reaches its highest point in World War I where industrial warfare, millions of people, you know, millions of bombs constantly produced, you die, you're replaced, you die, you're replaced, you know. Uh, so war becomes so destructive that it becomes impossible to, re to rely on a quick thrust or a quick strike against the enemy because the enemy is actually spread across 200 miles wide and 100 miles deep and you can't just overwhelm this entire region in one shot. So it becomes war of positions. War where you have multiple lines of trenches, Gramsci says, and you try to occupy one trench, and then you have to take over the other one, and you have to make sure that the enemy doesn't dig, dig another line of trench after you, right? So you have to take over their trenches before they can dig another trench. It's, yes. like, it's like chess, where, yes. the, where the war of maneuver is picking off your opponent's pieces, taking, taking action and weakening them, but the war of position, which my father taught me when he taught me chess, is laying out the pieces, laying a, a foundation for a, a major strike, but occupying strategically parts of the board or of... That's absolutely true. Deleuze and Guattari used that analogy in A Thousand Plateaus, that the game of chess versus the game of go. Game of chess is the game of the state. You know, it has these positions, these walls, these structures of defense, and you know, that make it difficult for quickly, for somebody to quickly take over uh, their position, right? So that's a very good, yeah. Yeah, and there were attempts to win decisively through technological innovations like po the introduction of poison gas, the introduction right. of tanks. But it fails. Airplanes. I mean, the tanks help, of course, at the end but when they're used in a new way, yeah. but the gas fails to be decisive, right? The, and it, the war grounds to a halt into this yeah. grueling, uh, because they were fighting Napoleon's way of war, but the conditions had changed, right? So this is what, what had happened. The wind changed. And the wind changed, yeah. Um, by the way, the US military still fights that way. They still think that the technological solution to their problem in war is gonna win. That's why they can't win a war against the Russians, because the Russians, as we'll see, fight in a totally different way of war. You know? But that's an interesting side story that Gramsci was kind of uh, not aware of. But So Gramsci says, okay, so what about politics then? I mean, the Russian Revolution is an example of war of maneuver. You know, you have a quick kind of a, a display of force which successfully destroys the, the existing state, right? And quickly builds its replacement, which is also in a weak position, but then it tries to defend itself. He says that's only possible in a society where politics functions without hegemony and where civil society is weak. What is civil society? Civil society is everything outside of the government proper that functions in defense of the government, right? That just ideology, culture, the education system, the church, you know, um, the media, if all of these things are somehow geared to seek the consent by the state and part of the population, then essentially civil society and military language are lines of trenches that, are, that begin at Washington DC, at the Capitol building or the White House, and extend all the way to New York City. So civil society in the United States would be millions and millions of trenches that are built by the state essentially protecting the White House and Congress, if you will. So if you wanna have a revolutionary politics and change the American state, you have to take over all of those trenches, which is essentially impossible today. The media. Right. You may take over some <laughs> trenches in the media, but there'll be other media that you have no access to because you have, they're, they're in a high castle somewhere, and the castle you have not been able to, con you know, to use the kind of a primitive medieval kind of castle analogy and whatnot. But so Gramsci's saying, okay, this is important. Maybe in societies outside of Russia, where politics is more dependent on hegemony and the consent of the ruled, 
where there are more trenches built in front of the state itself, uh, we have to fight a battle of position in our politics. We have to create organizations that can last 100 years, political organizations, who have money, resources, connections, ideas that renew themselves and can win or at least protect their own trenches right, against the others. Whereas in Russia in 1917, um, most of the vast majority of the population despised the aristocracy and the, and, and the emperor, the Tsar. So there was only one trench, and it was in front of the Winter Palace, and you know it was a very <laughs> short trench, and they were able to get around. Boom. Uh, incidentally, though, uh, Gramsci says that Lenin understood this, obviously, because as soon as they acquired power through a war of maneuver, Lenin immediately started to build a war of to transition to a war of position. But they, f I mean, they failed 60 years later. But this was sort of the. The, the message. They invested in education. They started creating statues of like leftist uh, luminaries to replace the statues of the church or the mm -hmm. old emperors, and you know to change the cultural space. Supporting writers and painters and whatever in the 1920s, and so this becomes kind of like a, a battle, kind of like the CIA funded abstract expressionists in the United States. I mean, this is a brilliant move. Yeah. You know, you you fund these great artists who are great artists, but politically you you sap their energy and you dedicate it to your own politics, mm -hmm. right? So it kind of becomes this war of position, war of very slow moving trench warfare. Yeah, if you yeah, imagine, still happening today. Yeah. If it <laughs> happened, if it happened, if it happened, yeah, if if it happened. But I just want to. CIA isn't that smart. They yeah. were that. They were. They're not anymore. Maybe they, they, they were. were. <laughs> They're no longer that smart. So here I want to read two quotes from Gramsci uh, in the War of Position. I mean, unfortunately, we're running out of time. It's just a couple more, <laughs> to ten more minutes. But Do you know what page you're reading from? Well, Gramsci says that uh, on, on two thirty one he says, the general criterion should be kept in mind that the comparison between military art and politics should always be taken with a pinch of salt. In other words, as a stimulus to thinking. So there is no correlation between war and politics that's direct. We can use military strategy and tactics to do politics, he says literally, verbatim. You know. However, in another place, in one of his other notes, in note 52, in notebook number 8, for example, Gramsci explicitly connects politics as war. This is where Foucault, I think, is getting his starting point. And Gramsci says, differently from this passage that I just read, in politics, the war of position trench warfare, large industrial war, you know, with huge numbers of people, technology. The war of position is the concept of hegemony, ruled by consent, that can only come into existence after certain things are already in place, namely the large popular organizations of the modern type parties, movements, that represent, as it were, the trenches and the permanent fortifications of the war of position. So actually, the trenches are the political organizations that exist. So he's basically saying, I'm not making a direct analogy, but I am making a direct analogy. And then yeah. another one, um, he says, the tactic of the great masses and the direct tactic of small groups. He says, OK, so what do we make of this? This belongs to the discussion about war of position and war of movement. War of position is mass war, world war. You know, millions of people committed in a certain way. War of maneuver is the, is the coup d'etat or is the revolutionary takeover by guerrilla the small group, warfare. guerrilla warfare, you know, um, Che Guevara's Foco, you know, strategy and um, the anarchist uh, militant attempts to destroy the state through an assassination of leading members of the state. Uh, my, my hero from the early 19th century, what was the great French uh, uh, terror, uh, you know, insurgent? Blanqui. Who? Blanqui. Blanqui. The, decapita the decapitating strike in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Scared the hell out of the French aristocracy. Um, well, Gramsci says that doesn't work, by the way, in the modern capitalist state where hegemony functions. You can assassinate the, pre uh, you know, the, the, the prime minister of, uh, of India, right? That's not going to make the state collapse. So you know, uh, This belongs to the discussion about war of position and war of movement. <laughs> Right? So political discussion belongs to the discussion of war. Insofar as it is reflected in the psychology of great strategists and the subalterns, the rule. It is also the point of intersection of strategy and tactics, both in politics and in the art of war. Right? So, so and we can get, and maybe we'll continue this next time, sort of the, the more in-depth discussion of Gramsci's uh, point of the war. But, but here I just want to conclude maybe 10 more minutes by sort of explaining a little bit more about 
how Gramsci understood war and politics and also to show that he kind of missed the, the latest developments in his time because he was in jail, you know, and he, <laughs> but something fundamentally transformed, it became even more complicated today. <laughs> so these words, tactics and strategy that everybody uses, we all use it, but what do they really mean? It depends. In the language of Napoleon's way of war up until World War I and in the politics of that time, Tactics roughly, uh, loosely refers to uh, individual battles and how to win them, right? Or individual strikes and how to win the strike. If you're going to uh, win a battle in the office, you know, how are you going to win that, right? So tactics refers in the common use of the word and in the military practice of the time uh, of the waging of individual battles. And strategy is sort of like um, what are the overarching goals of the war itself? And, and if you meet those goals, you you win the war and of course how do you prepare to achieve those goals like in other words indirectly how do you prepare to succeed on the tactical level in the level of battles right so so in in, in and this is how Gramsci understands the, the difference in war then uh, the tactical level is the level of battles and the level of strategy sort of like how to make the battle happen which destroys the enemy right so this becomes the practice of you know 200 years of war if not older I mean older, obviously, but it was talked about it this way for 200 years. And in politics, like the strike. In Russia, for example, there was a book published in 1918 or 19 called The Strike as War, right? So it's literally sort of what Gramsci's talking about. How do we use, uh, approach politics as a warlike battle? And then the union is organized in that way. Like you have different, different functions. This chain of command, communications, expectations, you know, and that kind of stuff. So that's like unionism without just sitting at a table and, you know, debating and bargaining, you know, different kind of unionism. <laughs> but, um, but in Gramsci's time, there was another transformation in warfare, which was very important, but which was unnoticed by most people at the time. Uh, Gramsci was in prison, so he didn't notice. And it happened in, in the Soviet Union because the Soviets had to improvise. Uh, like in other words World War I ended and their state ended and there was a new state and the people who were in control of the new state had to immediately fight a new war called the Civil War with which to maintain their position of power in the state their trenches were being overrun if you will by the counter-revolution mm. the problem was that Russia is very big in terms of its territory so um, all of a sudden it was discovered that the old ways of fighting the war like building trenches outside of cities or trying to force the enemy to meet you um, didn't really work because the Russian Civil War was different than World War II because it was both faster and slower. So it had elements that were taking place very quickly. Things were resolved, a battle was resolved in a matter of hours involving 10,000 people or it's something, a siege that would last like a year, you know, kind of like World War I or, or even before that. At the same time, this was a society that was rapidly industrializing, right? So, uh, and they were saying, okay, so what happens when the speed of airplanes moves from 120 miles an, you know, an hour to 300 miles an hour? And what happens when a gun can shoot six times a minute and now it can shoot 12 times a minute? And what happens if radios can communicate over 2,000 miles instead of 300 miles or whatever? And um, so a generation of people emerges in the Soviet state and other states as well, in Germany and France and the United States, that ask themselves the question, uh, is war changing? And of course, in, in the Soviet Union, because there were Marxists at that stage still, there were real Marxists who studied Marx and Hegel and you know thought about war and politics as the same thing and were aware of contradictions. Uh, Soviet Union produces a young generation of military theorists who are actual philosophers. Like they, they were equally versed in Marx, Capital, and Hegel, and Descartes, and as well as military theory, which was very different than, for example, the military theorists of Germany at the time who were, you know, steeped in military theory on a very high level, but, but they looked at it as an extension of politics, right? They didn't have this kind of... So what happens is, in 1932-33, there's the realization that actually the next war, and i.e. the next political struggle, because they're the same thing and the same continuum, there's a third level of war that, it, that has emerged because of the, 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 what has changed in the world, technology and, and, and practice and industrialization and so on and so forth. So the Soviets realized that um, actually the next war is going to happen on three levels. There's going to be the tactical level or the level of individual battles. But that's not going to be the most significant thing because there will not be a single battle. 
there will be many battles and actually the war of position will not be important either because uh, there are tools now emerging which will break the trenches no matter how many trenches you build at the same time the war of position is not going to be unimportant because it would still have its usefulness but the most important level of the war is going to be this new level and here's interestingly it's the level that is the in the mediator the, the, the hegelian triads again there's going to be a third level of war which is between tactics and strategy that which they called operations and operations essentially are the art of waging campaigns but they define campaigns not as what the army does in the field or whatever but what the entire society does focused on that particular campaign so it's a total conception it's total war essentially the Nazis uh, the Soviets came first with the conception of total war in their military theoretical works but the Germans they got there too with people like Junger you know the writer military veteran of World War One who wrote a book in the early 30s called total war so what is the next struggle what is the next we're finishing yeah it's like five more minutes what is the next decisive struggle the next decisive struggle is going to be a totalizing struggle which mobilizes the state in every capacity that it has and it directs it against a particular opponent right so there's totally a collapse of difference between war and peace between civilians and, and soldiers the factory is just as important as the military unit right and this becomes sort of a realization that because of the industrial scale of war because of the industrial scale of the killing because the industrial scale of the war that it's going to take place over continents uh, you can no longer differentiate between war and politics you can no longer differentiate between war and, 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 and peace and civilians and combatants it's impossible you're either part of the process or you're not but you cannot not be part of the process right so it becomes this kind of a it's terrifying it's totally terrifying because this explains World War II and this explains how pathetic the current attempts are to define non-combatant deaths. Since 1940, this has not been true. You cannot have civilians in modern warfare, in capitalist conditions of social production. You, have, you will always have total war if war exists. It right? also parallels the nature of total politics as well. And uh, while we're saying this for war, we're also saying the same thing about politics. Yeah. Total politics. On the, you know, on, on, on Twitter, why is, Trump using Twitter. Why not? It's, it's a vehicle, it's a medium f for exercising the political war of position. Just take one in pass. I just want to illustrate this diagram. Just also, end with it's also in the arts and in, in the media. Arts. I mean, when the revolution was going on in, in Germany, I mean, in Russia, they had Pravda following the battles with cameras and shooting that back to the front so people were watching the battles taking place and were engaged in what was going on thousands of miles away. Right, absolutely. So in modern politics, there is nothing that's not political in the fight and there's nothing that is available to us in society that stays outside of the realm of, of it being used in politics. Right, so this, be, this is actually the, the, what Gramsci is sort of proposing as whether it's good or bad, whether it's something we want or not, this is what, it, what politics demands of us today. And Eisenstein used dialectics to make his films, like yeah. Potemkin. It's an establishing shot, a negation of that shot, or a reaction, and then a synthesis. You should read his notebooks. I mean, they're not translated, yeah. unfortunately, but they are filled with, with reflections like Gramsci's notebooks about, about movies. And, and So just very quickly, 1932, uh, this young man, sort of Soviet military theorist slash philosopher Isserson formalizes the new way of politics and the new way of war and this is sort of an extension of Gramsci I think um, so instead of war of maneuver and war of position you have operations which include the two and what you're looking at a sketch a sketch that he drew which describes essentially one of three aspects it's in Hegelian triads of course like a good Marxist uh, mm -hmm. so there are three waves that participate in modern war what he called the first, second, and third strategic echelons. And notice the scale of the war. We're talking, the, each echelon takes over a thousand kilometers in depth. Um, and it has certain spe uh, specializations. You can translate this diagram into Gramsci's discussion of the political party and the three parts of it. And you can get very interesting kind of ideas if you use this as a metaphor. But this is how the Soviets fought World War II against the Nazis, and the Nazis never figured it out after the first year because all the commanders were killed of course by yeah. Stalin and the purge but 
he himself was arrested the day before World War II started. Their Who most important military thinker spent the, the entire war. What's his name? Isserson, totally unknown. But it's been, this is by the way translated by the US uh, Combined Arms uh, mm. General yeah. Staff Training College oh <laughs> four years ago. This is the book. Four years ago. Um, and the point was, just to end, the Nazis thought they could win the war and thus the political fight against communism, international communism, by essentially forcing the Red Army into a general fight, encircling it and defeating it, and thus defeating the political leadership as well. And they were perplexed that every time they were able to win a def victory over the Soviets and cross a trench line, essentially, and capture half a million people, the other side wouldn't give up, and even worse, they would have another trench line. And then the second trench line would fall apart, and then there would be a third, and then a fourth, and that, but the intensity of the resistance would not diminish. Somehow they're able to recover, or they had, it, it's not that they were able to recover, they had, they had basically implemented, by 1941, August, October, November, they were implementing Isserson's strategic defense plan of the Soviet Union, militarily, politically, which basically said they were no less than nine big trench lines protecting the state. Okay, uh, the Germans went through, uh, depending on how you count, uh, most of them in 1941, but there were at least two left that they could not cross, and they could never cross, because they were exhausted by that time. So, so uh, Gramsci is onto something very important, where his use of military metaphors shows that uh, in modern politics and a hyper-industrialized society, with massive use of industrial technology and industrialization of memory, industrialization of everything, Right, uh, politics is a to totalizing struggle, and if you have, if you, if we want to have any hopes for affecting the functioning of the state, uh, this is the scale that you have to confront the state on. So, so how do we do that? What is the organizational form? Uh, in, in other words, we don't have fragmentation. You know, all of these books have been written today about uh, doing fighting politics. What is that book by Hallow Harrow Holloway? Fighting, uh, getting power without surrendering power or something? Yeah. Or, these are profound mystifications. We have a higher concentration of force today than in Gramsci's time. We have a higher concentration of force than Foucault's time. Mm -hmm. We have war. Hopefully, World War III will never happen because it'll be on a scale far beyond the scale that Isserson imagined in World War II, right? Um, so, so we live in a society, capitalism is producing these hyper industrializations that are capturing, at this point, every, every part of, 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 of social life and, and more. Yeah. You, when you mentioned something a while ago, you made an allusion to how um, friends of yours in Bulgaria are now looking at um, ways to go beyond Marxism to address the Beyond, but with Marxism. With yeah. Marxism. Is what you just said exactly those changed conditions? I, I only described them on a superficial level uh, because there, there's a very kind of profound level of... Um, but I mean in terms of what we are confronting now, the change situation on the ground... I'll give you a short example because, because their work is in the process of being translated and dealt. But one short example is, um, the question is, in the capitalist workplace, do all workers participate in the production of surplus value? Which is a common, like if you listen to David Harvey or other examples, you know, workers, the, the point of exploitation is that, uh, well, not just David Harvey, but there's a certain classical e explanation that doesn't differentiate enough between on the question of the labor theory of value that Marx gave us. Uh, is the labor theory of value still hold today? Right? Um, and th some of the answers that you might encounter are, are that uh, maybe the people that Foucault was criticizing, the neoliberal economists like, like, um, Becker, University of Chicago, who said that every worker possesses capital in themselves and their own ability to create. Maybe that's actually true in, among workers in an office in Google who are innovative workers and through their innovations, right, they contribute to the formation of capital, but only they're the ones who are essentially useful to the corporation. The rest are just dead weight that have to be hired for social purposes of social peace. If that's true, then uh, how do we organize along class basis? Right, so it, it changes the entire basis of the conversation and makes it totally new, which means we have to have a new way of thinking about it. You know, so that's why we don't have workers' parties today because it, it doesn't make sense anymore, like it did in Gramsci's time.
then there's this book that's taken off by storm among millennials it's called bullshit jobs but it's just Graber's David Graeber yeah. yeah I know he's called bullshit but he's, no it's he's good I mean it's useful about what you just said it's, jobs yeah. that are only created for social peace and discipline he would say and that's exactly what people young people are becoming aware right. that they're engaged in but maybe the people who have the bullshit jobs are the ones on life support for purposes of pe public peace. They're giving their welfare handout, I mean, universal income or whatever they can do, right? Only to be able to have access to that tiny 5% of innovative workers who, for whatever reason, have the ability, the urge, the drive to invent something new, which renews the accumulation of capital, extends the system, it rewards those workers by giving them shares in Google and making them millionaires, right? It, it contributes to the consent, mm. right? And then the others who are in life support look at those people and they're like, wow, she started with me, but now she's a millionaire, so I can be too. You'll never be that for whatever reason, but you don't know that. It's good for you to think that, right? So it becomes this very interesting, uh, every worker possesses capital. This is University of Chicago, Becker, you know, the great, very serious thinker. I mean, I disagree with his politics, or, or Schumpeter, the, the importance of innovative labor. Do we on the left take seriously the, the, the division between innovative and non-innovative labor, you know, uh, that capital has to deal with, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, so these are interesting questions that uh, I think in general leftist thought has not, uh, like Gramsci, ta Gramsci's writing about workers, but it, it makes sense in his time. In his time, there are industrial workers who, you know, uh, so. You know, the engineers there would have been the petty bourgeois, you know, right. but now. Right, right. <laughs> so it's interesting. I, we couldn't obviously do justice to the essays, hmm. but maybe we can come back to it. But I think we, we kind of had an initial, initial thing. Very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs>